for this um, Bible study hour, I want us to look at Psalm 103. Uh, last week, we looked at Psalm 136 in what I called a theology of thanksgiving. I'd like us to go back to the Psalms, Psalm 103, and this week, look at a theology of praise. A theology of thanksgiving last week, a theology of praise this week. You'll see in this psalm, if you have the English Standard Version, the phrase repeated, bless the Lord, bless his holy name. That word bless, uh, literally in the Hebrew, could also be praise, adore, uh, give honor. So a theology of blessing or a theology of thanksgiving I want to look at. Psalm 103. These two psalms next to one another, you'll see Psalm 104 begins with similar words, bless the Lord, O my soul. Uh, De De Derek Kidner said of both of these psalms, 103 and 104, that in the galaxy of the Psalter, these are twin stars of the first magnitude. So you think of the Psalms, you know, as the stars in the galaxy. He says these two are twin stars. They're communicating essentially the same, some of the same truths, and they have the same thrust to praise the Lord, and they're of the first magnitude. They're bright, they're glorious stars. And so that's what I want to look at, Psalm 103 today. Before we do, um, I just want to reflect for a moment on the fact that we as Christians are to be a people of praise, aren't we? You think about what Christians do and how we gather. Think about a, a Christian gathering like today. A bunch of people, young, old, different ethnicities, different backgrounds, different cultures, different careers, different interests, right? Uh, some of you really, if you didn't intersect here, would never intersect in your life, would you? Um, we're just vast cultures and, and races and different uh, people groups. And we're gathering today, and we gather, and gatherings like this are happening all around the world, in Africa, in Asia, in Eastern Europe, Western Europe, in uh, North America, South America, Central America. And they gather together, and, and what do they do? They sit often in chairs like this, right? And they sing together. When else does that happen, right? Who, who, who just gets together and sings unless you're in choir or you're the arts department of your school? Or, but we get together and weekly we sing. And it's not because we all have an interest in choir. Um, if we all did, we'd have to politely tell some of you, you know, maybe you should find another hobby. Um, <laughs> but we get together, we sing, and then somebody stands up which I'm doing right now, and preaches and gives you a speech of sorts and you listen, some of you take notes and then you go back home and then you come back again and you do it again each week. Interesting, right? If you just kind of think about the uh, logistics of what we're doing. Well, we're coming together to praise God, to corporately raise our voices, to worship and adulate and bring honor and glory to God. We exist for praise. Really, as Christians, don't we? What's the text I like to give so often from Peter's first, God, uh, first epistle? 1 Peter 2, 9. Do you guys remember it? No, that's in that section. Uh, yeah, you are a, a royal nation, a holy priesthood, a people called out for his own possession to proclaim, I'm not going to quote it exactly, to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and drew you into his marvelous light. That's really one of the theme verses for the church. We exist to do something, to proclaim the excellencies of the one who saved us. That's one of the major purposes we exist as people, as Christians. We exist to praise God. Well, we know this theologically, don't we? We are to be a people of praise. But how often do we forget it practically? When you think about your life day to day, as you go to work, as you care for the kids, as you interact with your loved ones, how often do we forget to practically live lives focused on bringing praise and honor and glory to God? 
So often, isn't it? You get through your day. You get through your week. And you realize, have I been giving God the glory and the honor and the praise to him? It doesn't always mean you have to be singing. It doesn't always need to mean you're, you're formally in the corporate gathering. But 1 Corinthians 10.31 tells us, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. We are God-centered people seeking with every breath we breathe to bring him glory. Even when the um, Gentiles look in amongst us and they see us living, they are to say, what a great God, right? What does Jesus say? Good morning, welcome. Good morning. When, when we do our good works, what does Jesus say? We are to do our good works and the, the world will look in and say, give glory to God our Father, right? Everything we do emanating from our being is to be praise. But we so often forget it practically, though we know it theologically, and one of the great comforts of the Psalms is that it's, it's so practical. Not that anything in Scripture isn't practical, but what you find in the Psalms is theology and practice intersecting. The psalmist is constantly bringing their burdens and their cares and their worries and their struggles to the Lord and wrestling through them. It's an interesting pattern for you to, to note that when you're reading the Psalms, you'll start out oftentimes with a major problem. And the psalmist says, I don't know how I'm going to get through this, right? What's going on here? God, have you forgotten all about me? And then you get to the end of the psalm and it's always buttressed with, surely the, the Lord is good. Oh, I can trust in the Lord. I will praise him. He is a refuge. I will stay under his wings. Oh, God is good to me. I will never, right? Isn't that the Psalms? And that's so often for us, our experience. We enter into the courts of God. We enter into the time of prayer. And we go, what's, my life is unraveling. This, I can't do this. What's going to happen here? And then upon reflection upon God's word, communing with him in prayer, we come out steadfast and confident in who he is, what he's done and what he's doing and what he's promised to do. Isn't that true for you? Um, Experience that. Go to the Psalms and experience that. Uh, the Psalms are very um, real, very uh, intimate. You're going to some of these men who walked with God and you're seeing the innermost turmoil and struggles of their hearts. Well, we have that here with King David when it comes to praise. A man after God's own heart, we have a psalm written by David and it's written to David. The Psalms are often written to different people, whether it's to Israel, whether it's directly to God. And here, David is writing a psalm to himself. And the purpose for his writing, look there in verse 1, is to arouse within himself praise to God. Look at Psalm 103, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. He's writing to himself. I have been so helped. I want to say this at the outset. I have been so helped by James Montgomery Boyce's work through the Psalms. Um, I'll tell you, if you want a devotional tool, a devotional help in your, in your personal uh, times with the Lord, I, I can't think of any outside help aside from just scripture and meditating upon it that has been so uh, formative for me in my devotions than James Boyce's uh, work through the Psalms. And that's the outline I'm going to follow. What he does, he goes through in a few pages, he outlines the Psalm, he gives insights, it's devotional, it's sermonic. Um, so if you want a devotional help, James Boyce has three volumes on the Psalms, which I'd, I would greatly, uh, highly recommend. But so I want to go through and I just want to look at this psalm and kind of break it down in order where James Boyce broke it down in an outline and unpack how does David seek to arouse within himself worship and praise to God. So how should a person praise God? Let's look at verses 1 and 2. That's the first point. How should a person praise God? Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless 
his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. How should a person praise the Lord? James Boyce says here, David is rousing himself to remember God's benefits, and he does not want to do it superficially. You notice that. He doesn't want to praise God superficially. When, when we know theologically that we are to be a people of praise, and yet it doesn't always line up practically with our life, right? We say, I'm lacking in this. I don't see, feel like I'm giving God the praise and glory and honor due his name. Well, David is feeling that trouble, and so he's saying, okay, I'm going to set myself and to arouse within myself praise to God. It's a sad state, really, that what many in the Christian life call praise really isn't praise at all. Um, I'm not particularly fond of, and I'm not, you know, going to impugn people in their motives for this, but I'm not particularly fond when people say, yeah, I got to the service late and I missed the worship, right? Or I missed the praise, Or, hey, we're going to get together and just have a night of praise. Wait, what have you been doing every other time, right? And so so often the praise consists of um, the right setting, the right music, the emotional pull, right? And people say, oh, I'm I'm praising him now because they're, they're emotionally drawn in. But sadly, what so often happens is their minds are disconnected. They're not being aroused by truths about who God is, what he's done, what he's doing, what he's promised to do, how he's working in your life, the the power of the Holy Spirit to regenerate and to convict and sanctify. It's more of just an emotional feeling. And when they get that feeling, they say, okay, I'm praising him. Um, It's it's really a sad um, replacement for genuine praise. So we say, okay, then what is genuine praise in the Christian life? Well, look at what David says. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Just think about soul for a moment. Your soul is the part of your being that is going to live forever. But oftentimes when we speak of our soul, we're speaking about, or the heart, it can be interchanged at points, but your innermost being, right? To the depths of my soul, we say. David here is saying, oh, bless the Lord, the very core of my being. Bless him. I want from the deepest parts of me to praise him. Coming out from the depths of my soul. And then he buttresses that with the second part, or the second phrase, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. David doesn't want to praise him superficially. He he doesn't want to just praise God and feel it emotionally. He does want it emotionally, but he also wants it mentally. He wants his mind engaged. He wants every fiber of his being to engage in the worship and the praise of God. He's seeking to rouse himself with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his strength. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 6, 5. I want to show you this parallel text here. Deuteronomy 6, 5. It's a familiar one to us. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, or maybe start in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. What are the components that he's drawing in to praise there? Yeah, Zeke. Yeah, heart, soul, mind. This is the entirety of who you are. Your whole being is to enter in to praise. Um, 
Jonathan Edwards writes of the affections often. Edwards was a brilliant theologian, but he wasn't one of these theologians that kind of sat in his ivory tower. They, you know, they, it's a phrase, you, ivory tower theologians, they're the ones who are kind of disconnected with everyday life. They're disconnected with the working class uh, people. They're disconnected with the moms and the fathers, and they just debate theology, and it's really esoteric and kind of just out there. And the, Edwards could never be accused of being an ivory tower theologian. He was all about the affections. He was all about engaging truth with your heart, your mind, your soul, and experiential Christianity. That's why I love the Puritans. The Puritans kind of get this bad rap as being these stingy guys that walk down the street and like yelled at little kids who were playing that's not the Puritans. Maybe a few of them could have had that perception. The Puritans, if you are honest and you read them, you find immense practical experiential theology where they're pleading and imploring with the people to know the love of Christ and to experience the person of Jesus Christ. Well, that's what we have here. Deuteronomy 6. Love him with everything in you. And David is coming and saying, I want to praise him with everything in me. It's a good desire to have, isn't it? That we wouldn't just come to the worship service this morning and go through the motions, you know, sing the song. I was watching uh, a really glorious uh, hymn played in England at a royal event. I... I forget what the hymn was and I forget what the event was, but you had all these dignitaries in England and all these politicians in this, in this beautiful chapel and this wonderful organ and the, the organs going and the songs are going up. And, you know, as the camera's panning around this beautiful building, you see people just kind of holding their, uh, holding their song sheets and they know the song by heart and they're just kind of mouthing it, you know, looking around like this. And you could tell, okay, they know the song and they're singing because it's the right thing to do. But they weren't, you, you could tell, it's kind of dry, right? Well, when we come to worship and glorify God, that should be our desire. Oh, Lord, let all that is within me praise your name. Does that make sense? Anything you guys want to add to that? Anything I'm missing? Any thoughts? So, how should a person praise God? David tells us, with everything. With your heart, your mind, your soul. Don't come to, to worship. Look, um, especially in our kind of entertainment-driven age, in the next service, we're going to sing songs together. And we're going to praise. There's going to be a reading of the word. There's going to be praying of the word. Um, a lot of people come and they really can enjoy that. But then when the preacher gets up to preach for 45 minutes, they go, oh, okay, now this is the part that kind of is boring. You know, and I, I really love the worship, but I kind of sneak out during the sermon. Because they want the emotional effects or they want the, the things they can feel or, or hear. But when it comes time to now sit down, to open the text, to engage your mind, to dissect it, to discover the rich things, what is God teaching us? They say, well, I really don't want to engage my mind that hard, right? I'm not saying people maybe necessarily think that, but they can feel that. Well, we should come ready, yes, to worship him in our emotions, to worship him in singing, to worship him in our, in our affections, but then to also allow those affections and those motions, emotions to be motivated and driven by the engagement of our mind into the truth of God's word and allow that to cultivate and drive those emotions. Does that make sense? Okay, I don't want to belabor that point. So that's how should somebody worship or praise in, in heart, mind, soul. Why should a person praise God? Well, look again at verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. What's the reason why we should praise God? What's he give us? Yeah. Because of what he's done. Let's forget not all of his benefits. And we say, well, what are those benefits? Let's look in verses 3, 4, and 5. Let's see if we can name them. 
who forgives all iniquity, who heals all our diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. What, what are the benefits? Yeah, he redeems our life from the pit. There's redemption. What's another one? He heals our diseases. What's another one? Yeah, he forgives. He forgives all your iniquity. What are no, what's another? Yeah, he crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. That's what we looked at last week, Psalm 136, remember? The hased love of God, the mercy, it's never ending. Your steadfast love endures forever. Remember we repeated that 26 times? He crowns you with that, his steadfast love and mercy. What's another one? There's one more. Yeah, renews you like eagles. Actually, there's one more after that or before it. But yeah, he renews your youth like eagles. What's the last one? He satisfies you with good. Okay, let's look at each one of these briefly um, just to, to seek in our own hearts to stir up praise. Um, go to Psalm 130, verse 4. Let's look at forgiveness. Psalm 130, verse 4. I love this text. Psalm 130, verse 4. But with you, oh, let's start in verse 3. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Now, isn't that true? If the Lord marked iniquities, who could stand before him? No, no one. His law is perfect, right? And if he marked every single instance where you have transgressed his law, not only committing acts, but omitting what you should do, haven't loved me with all your heart, mind, strength there, haven't loved your neighbor as yourself, again and again and again, he's marking iniquities, and you go to stand before him seeking to be justified, who stands? No one. We failed miserably, right? Right? Shows you the ludicrousness of self-righteousness when people say, I'm good. Why would God let me in heaven? Because look at how good I am. It shows you they're not being, first of all, honest with themselves, nor honest with what God has said. He says, if I were to mark iniquities, none of you could stand before me. You'd all be condemned. But, verse 4, with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. That's an interesting text, isn't it? Do you, did you expect him to say feared? <laughs> what, what would we, and there's other texts which say elsewise, but what, what would you expect him to say? With you there's forgiveness that you may be, what's that? Envy. Uh, is that envy you said? With you there may be thanksgiving. thanksgiving. You could put it, um, multiplicity of things there, right? But he says, you forgive, that brings fear. Well, I think what he's speaking of is the fear of the Lord as the beginning of knowledge, recognizing that this judge against whom you have sinned had every right and ought to have condemned you, but then he poured out his justice on another, and there's that sense of trembling, and there's that sense of fear and all that I should have been cast to the depths of hell but he forgave me. It's the feeling of a man who's fallen off a cliff and he's been snagged by a branch sticking out by the back of his shirt and he's looking down upon the ravine below that should have dashed him to pieces and he's rejoicing that he hasn't been crushed and yet he's fearful at the thought that he was so close and he deserved it and he should have fallen, but he was saved. It's this this fear yet rejoicing in the forgiveness of God. So, God has forgiven us. Why? Because we deserved it? No. What did you deserve, do to deserve God's forgiveness? Nothing. Look, a lot of us are socially really nice people, right? Um, I think, looking at the people in this room, You'd help the old lady across the street if you saw her need, right? Um, you've done some good things socially in your life. 
if a multi-billionaire walked in here and pulled you out of the crowd and said, I'm going to give you all of my inheritance, would your first thought be, well, it's about time somebody's recognized all this stuff I've been doing. Nobody even saw me return the candy bar that the person didn't, you know, have me pay for in the grocery line. Thank you. Is that what your response would be? Honestly, nobody, nobody. You might be real self-righteous and arrogant and think you are a good person. But even when a billionaire comes and says, I'm going to give it to you all, you'd still be flabbergasted and say, why me, right? When you look honestly at your life and your sin, and it's not a billionaire who's given you measly dollars. It's the God of the universe who has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He says, blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. Don't you know you're going to judge angels, Christian? You've inherited everything. None of us stands as believers and says, well, yeah, it's about time. I should inherit the new heavens and the new earth. We stand there in awe at the recognition that grace has been bestowed upon us. Does that make sense? Why should I praise God with all of my being? Look at his forgiveness. He forgives all your iniquity. No condemnation in Christ Jesus. Not a single drop from your sin gets through to you in Christ. All of it. What about healing? Go to Malachi 4. This is the last um, book, one of the minor prophets in the New Testament. Malachi chapter 4. I love this text. Um, Malachi 4, beginning of verse 1. Behold, the day is coming burning like an oven when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. We can could go into all the different perspectives, perhaps, on this verse and when this is happening, when this is going to happen. Is this um, at, at different points in history? Has it happened in Christ? Is it yet to come? My only point, and I love this verse for the sake that I, for those who fear Christ, for those who fear his name, he says, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out triumphant. You shall go out strong. You shall go out treading down the wicked. Apply it as you will, but in Christ we have healing. The same thing is said in Isaiah 53. He has healed our... Oh, I'm not going to be able to quote it exactly. Can anybody quote it? Isaiah 53 about healing. He says... Um, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. This is absolutely true spiritually. Um, some could argue as to whether it's speaking as well of physical healing. Um, there is healing in Christ. Uh, James chapter 5 speaks of that. But certainly the healing that we have received as Christians as we've put our faith and hope in Christ, He heals our diseases. Certainly this isn't and couldn't be taken as the health, wealth, and prosperity teachers take it where He says He heals all of our diseases because we see even in Scripture where the godliest of men were not healed of their physical diseases. But we have a God who heals. He heals our souls. He heals our relationship with him he heals the condition of our hearts and he does offer healing for our bodies which is why we pray to him as christians we say lord be merciful and and give healing as we'll pray for our sister in reynosa in the second hour who's currently sick now further he redeems us he says from the life of the pit galatians 3 13 is a text i thought of I don't know if anyone else has another text, but Galatians 3, 13, we have redemption. 
in Christ. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Why should we praise God? He's redeemed us. Redemption is buying back. It has the idea of enslavement and then freedom from that enslavement. You've, rede- you've been redeemed from a debt. You've been redeemed from a slavery, a bondage. Brothers and sisters, we've been redeemed from multiple things. Can you think of what those are in Christ? What has he redeemed us from? What are some of those things? Yeah, William. Okay, so you just hit down two. The power of sin and the penalty of sin. Yeah, the wrath of God. That's the penalty, right? So if you're thinking, um, a lot of people, sadly, they think of the cross like this. Get out, of free, get out of hell free card, right? Oh, if I just say this prayer, then I will get redeemed from the penalty of my sin. Great, I'll take that deal. But they really don't want to be freed from the power of sin. Well, the gospel, Christ actually promises not only the penalty, yes, no hell, eternal life with him, but he actually promises freedom from the power of sin. That's regeneration, where he frees you from the grip of sin. He gives you a new heart, where you no longer want to sin, and you're no longer enslaved to it. Jesus said to the Pharisees, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. But thanks be to God, we have been enslaved to righteousness. Read Romans 8. Um, What else have we been redeemed from? Okay, yeah, we've... um, Yeah, I don't know how I'd put... Certainly we've been... I would say more that's been... uh, Yeah, we've been brought back into communion. Um... You know how I'd word that, Zeke, is we've been redeemed from, this is, we've been redeemed from the bondage we've had to Satan in his kingdom. And we've been brought into union and communion with with God. Yeah, it's the adoption. But we've been redeemed from enslavement to to the kingdom of darkness. You are of your father, the devil, John 8, 44, and he redeems us from that. Okay, so redemption. Why do we praise God? Redemption. He crowns us with steadfast love and mercy for sake of time. We looked at that last week. But everything, Christian, for you, everything this side of hell is mercy. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Steadfast love and mercy. Our sovereign God is sovereignly working all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Why don't you go to, um, let's go to Psalm 107, just quickly to look at satisfies. He satisfies us. Psalm 107. Verse 9. Verse 8, we'll start. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. For his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul. And the hungry soul he fills with good things. Isn't that true, Christian, for you? Haven't you found satisfaction in God? Jesus, I love Jesus' appeal at the end of the Feast of Booths. This this large feast uh, is going on in Jerusalem, the Feast of Booths. People have traveled from all over to partake of it. There's ceremonies, there's events, there's feasting. Jesus stands up toward the end of the feast. And you think of Christ. We think of him meek and mild and low voice at times. And it says in John chapter 7, he stood up and he cried out. So think of Christ standing up in a massive crowd and he cries out. He's he's proclaiming loudly and he says if anyone thirsts let him come to me and from him will flow rivers of living water powerful sentence he doesn't say if anyone desires um you know greater wealth or he doesn't say if anyone is sick and tired of this or that he just says if you're thirsty come to me and then notice what he doesn't say and i'll fill you up doesn't say that. 
It's implied. But he says, and from you will flow rivers of living water. Oh, you'll be filled up to overflowing. You'll go, think about it. This is the unbeliever's life. Think about it. The unbeliever is inherently selfish. Self-centered, that's idolatry, worshiping self. That's why you do what you want, right? You go where you want. You're self-centered. So you're a vacuum as an unbeliever. Like I've said before, so often the times we say to someone else outside of Christ, I love you. You know what's really being communicated? I love me and you make me feel better so I want you. It's just self-centered love. I love the way you make me feel, so I love you. It's a vacuum. I'm going to suck from you and suck from you and suck from you. And you make me feel better and you give me what I want. And you actually give me greater reputation and I can get something out of you. So that they're always inherently pulling. It's, it's, it's why you look at the abortion in our, in our nation. I've spoken sadly to young women who say, yeah, well, if I have this child, I won't be able to play volleyball at college. So get rid of the child. And it's me, right? I'm, I'm taking life, even the life of my child, so that I can be happy. It's a vacuum. When you get saved, what Christ is saying is this. You're thirsty. You might thirst for different things than the person next to you. Your thirst may be reputation, fame, money, security, peace, pleasure. But you're thirsty. So you're going through your life gratifying and seeking to gratify. And you're pulling, 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 pulling to get hungry or to get satisfied. But the reality is you will never be satisfied. Like the rapper Lil Wayne said in a song, I climb to the top of the ladder and the ladder gets taller. You think that's the pinnacle and you get there? That's why billionaires want more money, right? You think you're a billionaire. Why are you kicking these little guys out of business? Let them be. You've got money. That's why the celebrities are divorcing and people look at these people and go, you know, this person is the most handsome man alive, the most beautiful woman alive, and then they get divorced. And you go, why? Weren't you satisfied? Never satisfied. You always want more. And so Christ stands at the Feast of Booths and says, are you thirsty? I know you are. Come to me and you'll no longer be a life taker. You'll be a life giver. That's why the Christian can give and expend and go into relationships truly selfless, saying, I don't want anything from you. I want to give to you. That's why the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, I don't want what you can give me. I want you. I want to serve you and love you and help you and see you grow and see you make it to glory. I'm all about you. Now, come on. There's something you want from me. I mean, if I follow you, you're going to write a report letter and say 20 more people followed me. I mean, there's something you want from me, Paul. Nothing. How can that be? Because I'm satisfied. I have Christ. I have everything I need. I don't need what you can give me so I can serve you. Jesus says, come to me, are you thirsty? And out of you will flow life to others. You become not a vacuum, you become a life giver. Does that make sense? We're satisfied in Jesus Christ. Renewal. Um, This is the last one, and for sake of time, but renewal, Isaiah 40, uh, verse 30, we know it well. Those who wait on the Lord will, um, well, maybe we don't know it as well as I (laughs) thought I did. Isaiah 40, verse 30. Even youth shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The Lord renews our strength.